very, very pleased uh, with the season of lectures that we've had this year and the quality of people that we've uh, brought in over the last few years that we've been able to host. Um, the schedule for next year is already being fixed and uh, I promise that a number of very excellent people will be coming again for the Grange series for 2019. Um, but before that, we have one more excellent presenter this year, uh, Dr. Simon Gavrikol from the University of Cambridge. Um, I, I don't hesitate to say that he is simply one of the most interesting and important scholars uh, in, in the New Testament today. Um, I, uh, as a young student, wrote my, uh, my first book review uh, on, uh, on his uh, monograph on the Gospel of Thomas and its composition and original language. Um, Professor Gadderpool's research has focused around two poles, especially. Um, his first book and his last book uh, concentrated on Pauline soteriology. Um, and he most recently wrote an essay in defense of uh, substitution atonement. Um, between these two books, uh, there's a kind of accumulating uh, corpus of work uh, on uh, Christology and the Apocryphal Gospels, especially. So uh, not only is this monograph on the Gospel of Thomas, but an enormous 750 page commentary on Thomas, um, which uh, the, the library here had to go into mortgage to acquire, but it's happy to do so because it's, uh, it's an excellent piece of work. And the first uh, commentary on the Gospel of Judas, um, also a very, very important and interesting uh, work. Um, uh, famously affects uh, the pre-existent sun and the Christology, pre-existence uh, Christology of the Synoptic Gospels, which is a provocative uh, thesis. And the first read classics at Cambridge, uh, studied with James Dunn uh, at Durham, has been at Cambridge since 2007, correct? Um, apart from his academic accomplishments, he's also you know, a very pleasant human being. <laughs> and, and the assistant coach of one of the most successful cricket teams for boys 11 and under in all of Britain. So uh, tonight we'll hear a chapter from, uh, or a piece, a, a perspective into his most recent work, a kind of overview of these uh, extra canonical gospels. Uh, the, uh, Easter tide uh, theme, death and resurrection of Jesus in the Gospel of Peter. So, uh, Dr. Gatherpole, thank you and welcome. Thanks very much, Anthony, and, and uh, to everyone in the Ecole for their very warm welcome uh, since I've been here. It's, uh, I, I've been to Jerusalem many times, but this is my first. Uh, time in the year called, so thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, Marie-Joseph Lagrange had completed a series of commentaries on the four Gospels in his series Etudes Bibliques. During this period, the 1920s, he perhaps controversially commissioned a new volume in this series. He entrusted Léon Vagani with writing a commentary on the apocryphal Gospel of Peter. Lagrange himself wrote a lengthy preface to this commentary on the Gospel of Peter, which begins as follows. Okay, that was... <laughs> begins as follows. In asking Abbot Vaganet to be willing to write a commentary on the Gospel of Peter for the Etude Biblique series, I certainly did not mean to class this apocryphal book among the canonical scriptures. It seemed to me though that this curious fragment, which until now has not been studied in detail, could contribute, even if only by way of contrast, to our understanding of the four gospels, which are the gospel. And he continues, it was not long ago that rationalistic criticism made a great fuss of this text when it had just been discovered. With an ill-considered enthusiasm, Criticism found there a composition of equal value to, and from the same period as, the Synoptic Gospels. Since then, it has been necessary to backtrack. Another bitter disappointment. Encore une amère désillusion. What I want to do in this lecture is to provide a renewed assessment of the Gospel of Peter, 
There have been more claims since, the 19, since 1930 and uh, the work of Vagheni that uh, this work is of equal value to and from the same period as the canonical Gospels. So I want here to provide a 21st century answer to Monsieur Lagrange's 20th century question. First of all, just some introductory remarks for those of you who are perhaps not so familiar with the Gospel of Peter and don't have it by your bedside every night. What we have uh, of the Gospel of Peter is a large fragment of a passion and a resurrection narrative. It comes in a manuscript discovered in Egypt in 1886 to 87 by the French archaeological mission in Cairo, and the manuscript has been dated by scholars on the basis of the handwriting to around the 7th century. It was found in a grave in a Christian cemetery in a town called Panopolis, now called Akmim, which is about halfway down the Nile. This manuscript was deliberately designed to be a fragment, uh, perhaps uh, being buried with its owner as a kind of passport to the afterlife. So oddly enough, this uh, deliberately constructed fragment starts in the middle of a paragraph, as if you've got the translation that I've given you in front of me, in front of you, you can see it begins, now none of the Jews washed his hands, neither Herod nor any of his judges. And if you go to the end of the text, at the bottom of the other, other side of the page, you'll, you can see that it ends even in the middle of a sentence. I, Simon Peter and my brother, took our nets and went off to the sea, and with us was Levi, the son of Alphaeus, whom the Lord... We don't know. Now, as I say, the manuscript was designed to start and end this way. Just before the beginning of the text, uh, there's a decorated page, and the first page of the text has this cross at the top, which none of the other pages have. And uh, at the bottom, uh, afterwards, we have the, this unfinished sentence, followed by three crosses and a nice decorative uh, finish, and then a blank page uh, afterwards. So uh, it's a rather peculiarly constructed uh, manuscript. Now, I say that's what we have, but we actually don't have it because the manuscript itself is lost and all we have left are the photographs. There is one other manuscript uh, of the text which survives, but uh, as you can see from this photograph, uh, it's not a terribly helpful uh, uh, text, uh, not a very helpful manuscript uh, in terms of helping us understand the document. But the original Gospel of Peter was, I'm fairly sure, a full-length gospel, similar in size to one of the canonical gospels. We can guess this because the church father, Origen, says that the Gospel of Peter talks about Jesus' family, and specifically says that Jesus' family were the, uh, sorry, sorry, Jesus' siblings, I mean his brothers and sisters, were children of Joseph. No. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> Good. So the original Gospel of Peter was a full-length Gospel, probably similar in length to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And part of a clue to that is that Origen says that Jesus' brothers and sisters were uh, Joseph's children from a previous marriage. That is the tr what's traditionally called the Epiphanian view of Jesus' siblings, his brothers and sisters. Besides Origen, a number of the Church Fathers mention uh, Jesus uh, in the Gospel of Peter, and in fact the first reference we have to an Orthodox Christian community using a non-canonical apocryphal Gospel is of the Gospel of Peter. At the end of the 2nd century AD, the community in Rossos, uh, um, in, near Antioch in Syria, was apparently experimenting with this text. Then the bishop, Serapion of Antioch, came along. Later, Serapion wrote a book called On the So-Called Gospel of Peter, and this is what he says addressing the Christians in Rossus. When I visited you brothers, I assumed that you all held to the true faith, so I did not go in detail through the gospel published by them in Peter's name. P published by them, that's by the, uh, the authors, the community which wrote it. I said, if this is the only thing which seems to be making you mean-spirited, then let it be read. But Serapion later realised he'd made a mistake. But I have now learned, he writes, that their minds, the minds of these heretics, were in a heretical hole 
and so I'm eager to come to see you again. Expect me soon. We have been enabled to go through it and discover that most of it indeed was in accordance with the true teaching of the Saviour, but that some things were added. Uh, Eusebius of Caesarea in the 4th century also <coughs> mentions the Gospel of Peter as a text which has never been part of the ecclesiastical tradition. And finally, in the 7th century, it appears in a list of prohibited books, uh, books which are not uh, permitted to be read in church. So you can see uh, this is just a fragment uh, of the text uh, with a list of Gospels which are not permitted to be read. Gospel in Matthias' name, Barnabas' name, James the Less's name, Gospel in the Apostle Peter's name. This is apocryphal. So uh, this, is, and this is from a list probably uh, com composed in France in the 7th century and traditionally associated with Pope Galatius. Now we'll get onto the content in detail in a moment, but just uh, to give you a rough idea uh, in summary, a rough overview of our fragment, it starts with Jesus being handed over to be crucified. And you can see if you've got the tra translation there in front of you at the top in verse 2. Then King Herod ordered them to take the Lord and said to them, what I have ordered you to do to him, do. So that's how it begins. And uh, at the, uh, uh, then on the uh, uh, bottom of that first page, you've got the burial and verse 33. And they, that's the Roman soldiers, placed seven seals on the tomb and pitched a tent there and stood guard. And then over the page at the top of the second page, you can see that uh, we get on to the day after Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, the Sabbath or Holy Saturday. So in verse 34 there, early in the morning when the Sabbath was dawning, a crowd came, to Jeru came from Jerusalem and its surrounding country to see the sealed tomb. So that's on the Sabbath. And then next in verse 35, uh, we have Easter Sunday. But in the night in which the Lord's day dawned while the soldiers were guarding two by two on duty, there was a great voice in the sky. So uh, roughly the first page of of the translation that I've given you covers the death and burial of Jesus and the, the second page covers the resurrection and the appearances. One brief clarification before we get stuck into the text properly. I realise that in Jerusalem of all places I need to make it clear when I'm, the, when I'm talking about the Jews in this lecture, I'm talking about what the Gospel of Peter thinks uh, of the Jews uh, and rather than my own uh, views, and because as you'll discover, the Gospel of Peter doesn't like Jews very much. So, the death of Jesus in the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter is full of elements which are familiar from the canonical Gospels. After an initial episode involving Herod, Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea, there is a scene in which Jesus mocked, and so in verses 6 to 9 uh, of the text, uh, you can see that Jesus is verbally taunted as a king, given a crown of thorns, spat upon, beaten and whipped. Then in verses 10 to 14, he's crucified with two criminals either side of him. A notice is fixed to the cross announcing that he's king of Israel uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a mockery. His clothes are divided up and one of the criminals uh, says that we have, been we have been executed justly as evildoers, but this man uh, is, is unjustly punished because he's the saviour of the world. Then in verses 15 to 18, darkness covers the land. Those who crucify Jesus give him a, a drink of uh, gall mixed with vinegar. And Jesus cries a cry of dereliction, and the, te the curtain of the temple is torn miraculously at ha in half. So in, at one level, the crucifixion scene in the Gospel of Peter sounds very conventional. And yet, the ingredients are very slightly altered and rearranged, so that in the end, the whole episode has a rather different mood and a different meaning. In verse 19, Jesus' cry of dereliction, for example, is more about his own power leaving him. My power, O power, you have left me, forsaken me. And his death is described a bit more like an ascension than uh, a normal death. He's taken up, uh, the Gospel of Peter says. But let me focus in particular on two other ways in which the Gospel of Peter mixes the ingredients. The first way is, in, is that in the crucifixion narrative, in the Gospel of Peter, it is the Jews who do virtually everything. 
If you look on the first page of the translation, you can see that in verses 3 to 4, there's a short episode at the beginning where Joseph of Arimathea asks for, jo for Pilate's help in retrieving Jesus' body for burial. But Pontius Pilate, even though he's the Roman governor, has to ask Herod's permission to get the body. This is because in the Gospel of Peter, the Jews are entirely responsible for the death of Jesus, and Pontius Pilate and the Romans play no role. They appear uh, later in the resurrection narrative. So in verse 2, it is Herod who orders Jesus to be taken away, to be executed. And then, very importantly, in verse 5, Herod hands Jesus over to the people, that's to the Jews, to deal with Jesus. That reference to the people taking charge of Jesus is crucial because uh, the, the people are then going to be uh, the uh, main actors in the crucifixion narrative from now on. The people, not the soldiers, not the Roman soldiers, are the main agents of the crucifixion and the surrounding events. In verses 6 to 9, it's then these Jews, rather than the Romans, in the canonical, as in the canonical Gospels, who mock Jesus as king of Israel and put a crown of thorns on his head. And so if we compare this with uh, the way as this, these events are described in, uh, for example, Mark's Gospel, this is how Mark describes it. The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him, and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him. So here is the soldiers who are uh, doing all of these actions. A mark here, and in all the canonical Gospels, with the possible exception of Luke, who is ambiguous at times, uh, it's the Roman soldiers who mock Jesus, put the purple robe and crown of thorns on him, and beat him. In the Gospel of Peter, this is all transferred to the people, that is, to the Jews. Then in verses 10 to 14, it's the Jews who crucify Jesus, and the Jews who put up the notice that Jesus is the King of Israel. And then they divide up his clothes, uh, although again, as in the, in, the, in the canonical Gospels, it's the Roman soldiers who perform these actions. Finally, the Jews uh, give Jesus the drink of gall mixed with vinegar, which is the last event in the Gospel of Peter before Jesus dies. And the Gospel of Peter's conclusion to all this is clear. So verse 17, which is uh, up there on the, on the screen. And so they brought everything to fulfilment, bringing upon themselves the full measure of their sins. As we'll come on to in more detail later, it's not so much God or Christ who is fulfilling scripture here, but the Jews, and they, uh, in fulfilling scripture, have brought their guilt to full measure. And this is elaborated further in a second striking feature of the crucifixion narrative in the Gospel of Peter, the darkness. One of the long-standing difficulties in interpreting the passion narratives in the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke in particular, is trying to understand the signs which accompany Jesus' death. So, because the Greek word uh, ge or ha'aret, like ha'aret, can mean land or earth, when the canonical Gospels talk about the darkness coming on the land or earth, it's unclear whether this is specifically a reference to the land of Israel or whether this is a kind of cosmic mourning, uh, M-O-U-R-N. Is the tearing of the curtain, similarly in the temple, a positive or a negative sign? Does the tearing of the curtain in the canonical Gospels mean that uh, the barrier to the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest once a year could uh, enter, does the tearing of the curtain mean now that access is available to everyone to the presence of God, or is the tearing of the curtain more of a judgment upon the temple? <coughs> Many of these difficulties in interpreting the Passion narratives and their surrounding events in the canonical Gospels are uh, eliminated, disappear, in the Gospel of Peter, where things are much more straightforward. And this is because of the darkness. The, dar the darkness that lasts for three hours in the canonical Gospels is a time of silence and inactivity, while in the Gospel of Peter it's uh, full of important uh, episodes and it's one of the keys to understanding the crucifixion in this text. 
First, the Gospel of Peter is clear where the darkness is covering. In verse, 40, verse 15, it reads, It was midday, and darkness engulfed the whole of Judea. So this unambiguously means that the darkness in the Gospel of Peter is focused on Judea. Secondly, there's one Old Testament law that the Gospel of Peter knows, or knows roughly without the details. In Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23, we have this law here. If someone guilty of a capital offence is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on a pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that, that same day, because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Now the Gospel of Peter remembers or misremembers this law in the following way. Gospel of Peter, verse 15, it is written for them, the sun must not set on a murdered man. This has already been quoted at the beginning of the fragment, but more significantly, it's quoted again immediately after the darkness starts. As a result, the darkness automatically makes the people guilty of disobedience to the law because they've left a man uh, exposed uh, after, after dark. Thirdly, and relatedly, the uh, darkness causes people to trip over. Many people, thinking it was night, were milling around with lamps and falling over. Now this falling, of course, is literal. People are stumbling around in the dark. Uh, but it also may be metaphorical as well. The falling of the Jewish people in the dark here may have a theological resonance. In his letter to the Romans, Paul asks the question about Israel, have they stumbled so as to fall? For Paul gives the answer to this question, by no means. But uh, the Gospel of Peter's answer to this question seems to be yes, they have fallen. Finally, there are two signs which in the canonical Gospels take place in the light, but which in the Gospel of Peter take place during the darkness. The tearing of the curtain, which I mentioned earlier in the Gospel of Peter, takes place during this darkness. And so it's difficult to understand the tearing of the curtain as something positive, uh, providing access to God. It seems more, much more likely in the dark, connected with the darkness to be something which is a, a judgment on the temple. And the terrifying earthquake also takes place in the dark. So these two, events are, these two events are not events of cosmic significance, but are acts of judgment which the Gospel of Peter specifically directs at the Jews. Hence the despairing conclusion. Then the Jews and their elders and priests realised what sort of evil they had brought upon themselves and began to mourn, woe to us for our sins, the judgment and end of Jerusalem is looming. I say this as a despairing conclusion because rather like Judas's uh, despair in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, this despair does not lead to repentance. In the case of the Jews in the Gospel of Peter, this leads to an intensification of plotting against Jesus and the disciples. So the elders say to Pilate, Give us soldiers to guard this tomb, guard his tomb for three days, in case his disciples come and steal the body. The people might imagine that he is risen from the dead and bring dis disaster on us. So in summary, many of the ingredients that we have seen in the, which, we, which we know of in the canonical gospels, in their passion narratives, are also found in the gospel of Peter. But in Peter, they're selected and altered and rearranged to make the Jews the sole agents of the crucifixion. As a result, their sins are brought to full measure and then the judgment comes. Darkness envelops the whole of the land and the earth shakes and the temple is torn. The temple veil is torn. And this leads to the conclusion for the Gospel of Peter that the destruction of the city of Jerusalem cannot be far away. More briefly, the resurrection scene is less gloomy and more like an imaginative retelling of the resurrection tradition without so much negativity. This scene is one of the most famous in the Gospel of Peter. In the night of Easter morning, the other morning this time, the soldiers guarding Jesus' tomb see two angels enter Jesus' tomb. While they are reporting back to the centurion about these angels, this happens. 
So this is uh, picking up verse 39 if you have the text in front of you. As they were explaining what they had seen, again, they now saw coming out of the tomb three men, two of them supporting the other one, and a cross following behind them. The heads of the two reached up to heaven, but the head of the one led along by them went up beyond the heavens. And they heard a voice from the heavens saying, have you preached to those who are asleep? And an answer was heard from the cross, yes. So a gigantic Jesus comes out of the tomb, escorted by two almost as gigantic angels. And here is an attempt to show how exalted Jesus really is. It's literally a high Christology. But perhaps the main point here is in this voice of God. The voice of God asks here, have you gone down to hell to preach the good news to the dead? Or down to Hades to preach the good news to the dead. Then the voice comes back, not so much from Jesus, but from the cross. Yes. And I think the point here is that the, the, the cross and Jesus are, are, uh, are, are two ways of expressing the same crucified Jesus. Jesus really has, according to the Gospel of Peter, been down to the dead to bring about what later Christian theology is called the harrowing of hell. The idea that on Holy Saturday, Jesus descends to the dead to preach the good news to Old Testament saints uh, uh, of Israel and righteous Gentiles. This was a very prominent idea in second century Christianity. And Adolf von Harnack once wrote that what to us might seem like an outdated notion from a bygone age was in the second century almost the most important part of Jesus' preaching. And this seems to be true in the Gospel of Peter. For the author of this text, the cross, the death of Jesus itself, doesn't, uh, isn't presented as having saving significance. But Jesus' death is the necessary preliminary step for him to be able to go down to Hades to preach the good news, the saving good news to the dead. Now, interest in the Gospel of Peter from scholars uh, had continued to the present day. As I mentioned, a number of scholars since uh, Lagrange and Bagagny uh, have continued to argue that the Gospel of Peter contains uh, more ancient and more historically reliable traditions about the death of Jesus uh, by comparison with the canonical Gospels, although others have concluded that it comes from well into the second century. So what I want to do in these last two points is to provide a historical and theological evaluation of the Gospel of Peter. One of the things that is noticeable from the Gospel of Peter is the way in which it contains a number of historical, chronological and cultural oddities, uh, many of which, uh, uh, which are obviously compressed into quite a short amount of, of text. And these rather detract from its reliability as a kind of historical source. So to begin with, some historical oddities. First, right at the beginning of the surviving narrative in verse 1, it's slightly unexpected that Herod's judiciary would be attending him during a visit to Jerusalem for Passover, perhaps. More seriously, in verse 2, it is Herod who orders Jesus' crucifixion. And during Jesus' crucifixion, the Gospel of Peter seems to presuppose a detail specific to John's Gospel. In John 19, uh, the other victims of crucifixion have their legs broken, of course. And the Gospel of Peter reports that the behaviour of one of the criminals uh, crucified with Jesus irritates the executioners. And so, quote, verse 14, they got annoyed with him and ordered his legs not to be broken so that he would die in agony. The Gospel of Peter already in the morning then seems to assume that the victims are going to have their legs broken, although there's nothing in the cultural environment that would suggest that, that this is the norm unless you know John's Gospel. Additionally, before the crucifixion, I've mentioned that Joseph of Arimathea asks for permission to bury Jesus. And so Pilate asks Herod to release the body. In verse 5, Herod replies to Pilate, Brother Pilate, even if no one had asked for him, we would bury him, especially since the Sabbath is dawning. For it is written in the law, the sun must not set over a murdered man. So a couple of oddities there. Uh, first, Herod addressing the Roman governor as Brother Pilate uh, is something of a surprise. And uh, as is the quotation of the law, the sun must not set over a murdered man. 
As I mentioned earlier, this is obviously a, a rather bungled and uh, mistaken version of the law in Deuteronomy that a body must not be left exposed overnight. But that commandment says nothing about the person being murdered. And the word of, wording of the law in the Gospel, Gospel of Peter has hardly anything in common with the wording in the Greek Old Testament. So that's some, a, a few possible historical oddities. Some of the chronology is also rather peculiar or problematic. Already on the Friday morning before Jesus' crucifixion, Herod states that the Sabbath is already dawning in verse 5, which is an odd thing to say on, on, on Friday morning. At the same time, though, he, he also sort of corrects himself later on by saying that the Sabbath does in fact begin on Saturday morning, the day after the crucifixion, when he says that Peter and the other disciples fasted and sat mourning and weeping all day until all night, until the Sabbath. And it's on Saturday morning, when the Sabbath is really dawning, that people come to in in inspect Jesus too. The author is perhaps, and it's not, not quite clear here, but the author is perhaps also unaware of how long the Festival of Unleavened Bread lasted. According to the beginning of the Gospel of Peter, the feast began on the Sabbath, the day uh, after Jesus' crucifixion. The festival of unleavened bread, according to the Torah, lasts for seven days. Uh, Exodus 12 says it lasts from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. What's striking in the Gospel of Peter is that on the last day of the festival of un unleavened bread, seven days after the crucifixion, the disciples are still mourning and the disciples still haven't seen the risen Jesus. So uh, this could be a, a different view of the whole chronology of the resurrection, uh, or alternatively, it could be that the author is thinking in terms of the Christian calendar and assumes that the festival is the same length as the Easter weekend. So there are some possible chronological peculiarities there, certainly in the case of the Sabbath. Moving on to geography, the Gospel of Peter doesn't contain any startling geographical mistakes like we often see in the apocryphal gospels. Uh, in the infancy gospel of Thomas, for example, uh, Jesus is said to have been born in Nazareth, which is a town in the region uh, or country of Bethlehem. Uh, while in the gospel of Barnabas, uh, it says that Jesus sails to Nazareth at one point. What we have in the gospel of Peter is instead a relatively lack, relative lack of interest in geography. So, for example, the figure called in all four canonical Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea, is simply introduced, and he is introduced in the text uh, there, uh, as just plain Joseph. Now, this isn't just a lack of interest in geography. It's actually a problem in the way that you name someone. Because, of course, you can't introduce a story in, set in first century Judea. You can't introduce someone simply as Joseph. Uh, which, uh, according to Talilan statistics, uh, was the second most common name for a Jewish man at the time. We might conclude the same about Peter's rather unclear statement at the very end of the surviving text, in verse 60, that Simon Peter and his brother went off from Jerusalem to the sea. Since they took their nets, we can probably deduce that they didn't go to the Dead Sea, but we're not told which sea exactly they did go to. There are, though, two places where the Gospel of Peter is specific about geography, and that's where the anti-Jewish tendency uh, comes to expression. As I mentioned earlier, Peter does emphasise the locality of where judgment falls. In verse 15, it was midday and darkness engulfed the whole of Judea. And in verse 20, the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem was torn in two, a scene which the Gospel of Peter takes to be prefigure or portend the destruction in AD 70. The various quirks of uh, oddities of Peter's cultural outlook then suggest some measure of distance from the realities of first century Palestine. The historical oddities, chronological peculiarities, and the lack of concern with geographical detail don't inspire much confidence in the Gospel of Peter as a historical source. One of the main theological criticisms of the Gospel of Peter has, uh, over the past century, during which it's been known, 
is that the Gospel of Peter is docetic. That is, it has a picture of Jesus in which Jesus only seems to be a human being, but is in fact a merely spiritual uh, character. What I want to do in this last section is to take a different uh, approach to the question of, of theology by offering some theological reflections on the Gospel of Peter and how it treats the earliest Christian charisma or message. One Paul reports, the Apostle Paul reports in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that the earliest Christian charisma ran as follows, and this is on your handout. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. The core of the earliest Christian gospel then was the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, both events taking place according to the scriptures and each event having a kind of certification. The death is certified by the burial and the resurrection is certified by the appearances. And this is not Paul's private gospel, which he as a maverick, eccentric apostle preached. No, Paul goes on to state a few verses later, after he's listed more witnesses to the resurrection in verse 11 of that chapter, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. So all the apostles in the wider circle of Jesus' disciples preach this gospel of Christ's death for sins and resurrection according to the scriptures. And this is the same gospel which the Corinthians came to believe. Paul is clearly not manuf manufacturing this agreement out of thin air. The same theological present truths are presented as uh, of similar importance in Hebrews, 1 Peter, and the book of Revelation. And these are also affirmed in the four canonical gospels. All four canonical gospels affirm that Jesus as the Messiah died uh, a death of sa saving significance, rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So these elements, Christ's saving death, his resurrection on the third day, and all of this taking place in accordance with the scriptural testimony, uh, are the core of the earliest Christian charisma. So how does the Gospel of Peter fit in with this early Christian charisma? Well, in some respects, it's difficult to tell. Since we only have a fragment of it, it's hard to know what, whether the Gospel of Peter denies or ignores uh, certain themes. But we can look briefly at what the text says about these three central themes. So first, what about Jesus' death for our sins, as Paul reports it? The first point that we've seen in, already in the account of the death of Jesus in the surrounding, and the surrounding events in the Gospel of Peter is that it's a scene of fairly constant gloom. The focus is on the judgment of the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem, and the land of Judea. There is very little positive to be seen in the narrative of Jesus' death. What can be said positively, perhaps, is simply that Jesus' death is necess a necessary precursor or preliminary to his descent into Hades to preach the good news to the dead. Rather more significant in the Gospel of Peter uh, is the resurrection narrative, which we've seen is considerably more developed than the, gospel, the, the, the narrative the resurrection appearances in the canonical Gospels. One of the main purposes of the resurrection scene is to confirm that actually the harrowing of hell did take place. Jesus did go down and preach the good news to the dead. The cross, we remember, replies yes to the question. So the resurrection scene gives assurance that this has actually happened. The resurrection of Jesus in the Gospel of Peter with its witness to the harrowing of hell, the gigantic Jesus coming out of the tomb and the two escorting angels, is therefore quite different from what we see in the canonical Gospels. But there's also an important sense in which the Gospel of Peter continues the resurrection tradition, the fact that it happens on the third day. Uh, as we can, as we've, seen, we've seen that in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, it also comes in Acts, uh, and in the chronology of the canonical Gospels, and something which is uh, a core uh, feature of the, of the resurrection. And the Gospel of Peter's chronology agrees with this uh, crucifixion on Friday, Holy Saturday, and then resurrection 
what the Gospel of Peter already calls the Lord's Day. So despite the rather outlandish and unusual resurrection legend in the Gospel of Peter, in one respect it sticks to the non-negotiable third day tradition. Finally, were these actions, the death and resurrection of Jesus, according to the scriptures for the Gospel of Peter? Let's take the death first. And here the answer to the question of whether it took place according to the scriptures is yes and no. That's a very English sort of answer. Um, think, but think back to the uh, discussion of the crucifixion earlier. In verse 12, we had the dividing of the clothes, then the non-breaking of the legs. Uh, in verse 14, then the darkness over the land, then the offering of the drink, uh, which is a mixture of gall and vinegar. All of these events have strong scriptural resonances from the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. Then after this, the Gospel of Peter concludes as follows. And so they brought everything to fulfilment, bringing upon themselves the full measure of their sins. So we do have fulfilment here, but it's notable who brings this full fulfilment about. There's nothing in the Gospel of Peter about God bringing things to fulfilment, which is what is assumed, of course, in many other Christian works. There's nothing of Jesus orchestrating events to take place according to scripture, uh, as also happens in the canonical gospels. Here, the key point is that the Jews have fulfilled their role in acting out the wicked scenes of scripture, in particular from the Psalms. And the effect of this fulfilling of scripture is not so that get God's saving purpose through the cross would be fulfilled. Rather, in the completing this catalogue of wickedness, the people, according to the narrative, have reached the full measure of their sin. The resurrection also doesn't have, any, doesn't have any scriptural resonances, and so does nothing to give any hope uh, to the people. There's a further distancing of the author of the Gospel of Peter from scripture. I've already mentioned verse 15, but not the whole of it. Uh, here uh, in the Gospel of Peter, verse 15, the author says that, uh, uh, well, says as follows. And the people were in tumult, distressed at the thought that the sun had already set while he was alive. It is written for them, the sun must not set over a murdered man. So here the author seems to have some distance between himself, as a, a, the, the, the voice of the author has some distance from the law, which is for them, the Jews. So overall, the Gospel of Peter is, as far as we can tell, only partly in continuity with early Christian kerygma. To conclude briefly, the Gospel of Peter offers us a fascinating window into some of the theological tendencies of the second century AD. Sadly, there's a growing anti-Jewish tendency in much of the apocryphal literature of that time. One sees the same thing in the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, uh, and, and much of the uh, apocryphal literature. There's also a developing understanding in the second century of the harrowing of hell. This begins to be mentioned around the same time as the Gospel of Peter by Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. There's also uh, in the Gospel of Peter, uh, a continu a t a Gospel of Peter reflects also a tendency in the second century to embellish the resurrection narratives and from other texts of a similar time, uh, one finds similar depictions of Jesus. So in the ascension of Isaiah, for example, uh, Jesus is carried on the shoulders of two angels, uh, rather as he's led uh, by two angels in the Gospel of Peter. Coming from this later period, it reflects a distance from the culture of first century Palestine, which means it's difficult for the author to get historical detail correct. And finally, as, at least as far as we can tell from this fragment, and as I said, that, mean, that means we need to be uh, tentative in conclusions, but the Gospel of Peter does not seem to continue the apostolic gospel of Christ's saving death and resurrection according to the scriptures. That seems to be something which the Gospel of Peter distances himself from, uh, the author distances himself from that, much as is the case, again, in other apocryphal gospels like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. Although the Gospel of Peter is in many ways a fascinating document, I believe that Monsieur Lagrange was fund fundamentally correct, that if we're looking to the Gospel of Peter for the historical Jesus and theological truth, we are likely to be disappointed. Thank you very much for listening.
you very much for this very accessible uh, and also nuanced presentation. There's a number of uh, silent interlocutors uh, moving behind the scenes here. We've mentioned uh, one of them, uh, Francis Watson, and, and his book. And I think what's presented here, which is very attractive, is the idea of a criterion uh, of judgment, uh, not simply chronological, uh, but uh, in terms of content in this regular fide, uh, we could speak about a canon, but in the, in the apostolic uh, charisma. Um, I think that's a very, very useful way to uh, maybe address this, this question or this thesis um, that all differences um, between the canonical and apocryphal gospels are extrinsic, uh, anachronistic, uh, and, uh, uh, and arbitrary. Um, so if I can uh, take the right to pose the first question, um, I'd like to just uh, push this issue of uh, docetism, mm. um, which I think is, is very interesting and like a lot of problems uh, in the text, hard to resolve because we're dealing with a fragment. Um, but even if the death of Jesus, as you say, and I think rightly so, is presented as a kind of um, eschatological guilt trip uh, on the Jews and were lacking a certain uh, theology of, of salvation, saving significance uh, of his death, I wonder if the harrowing of hell is an idiom of salvation through his death. And to that extent, I wonder how we should think about the docetism. Um, I'm sure you know uh, this article from Peter Head uh, a number of years ago where the, the silence motif in, in verse 1, Jesus is silent as though he felt no pain. Mm -hmm. This is something we also have in Origen, Dionysius, other, other characters. The silence motif is simply moved from the judgment scene uh, to, the, mm -hmm. to the cross scene. Um, the, the departure of his power is a cry of dereliction. Um, and could be understood as a circumlocution, the dunamis as, uh, as a way of speaking about my God instead of my indwelling uh, divine spark. Um, so how would you respond to some of those uh, questions about uh, the, the theology, uh, both of Jesus' death and of the, the, the harrowing of hell as, as having a soteriological uh, value? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in, in, in the death scene, the, the silence of Jesus is, has been one of the main reasons why some have thought that Jesus in the Gospel of Peter is not really a human being. Um, and you can find some parallels which might support that uh, understanding. But you can also find similar passages in uh, early Christian martyrdoms uh, where the martyrs are, are silent. And it's, it's not so much a... The, the masters are very human human beings, but it's a demonstration of the, their great virtue. I mean, you, I suppose anyone who had witnessed in the ancient world a crucifixion would see people screaming and shouting. You know, and, and we have in ancient literature some reports of the kinds of things that people said when they were being crucified, you know, wishing they'd never been born and cursing their parents and, uh, for, for having them. And, uh, um, and so the silence of Jesus on the cross is a, is a very noticeable um, noticeable thing, but can also be paralleled in the torturing of martyrs. So it, 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 it's exactly one of those scenes which could go either way, and it's, which means I think we need to be sort of probably agnostic on the question of, of, of docetism. Um, similarly, the cry of dereliction could also be understood uh, as portraying Jesus as a kind of angelic being. Uh, but on the other hand, the way in which uh, the Gospel of Peter, after the death, talks about the body of the Lord being laid on the ground and the earth shaking, seems to present quite a physical Jesus. Um, and the, the, the fact that it, the, the, the dead Jesus is called the Lord um, makes it difficult, I think, to have a kind of separate, it's too much of a separationist understanding of the physical shell and the, the real, a real spiritual Jesus. Um, so that's what I would say. That, that, that those are the sort of ambiguities around this question of whether Jesus was a really, really a human being or not. Um, if, if, if we had the rest of the text, then we, we would probably be able to have a more confident judgment either way. 
Yes, thank you. I, I, I think the same thing, <coughs> which is which is why I wonder if um, if there is, uh, in fact, a kind of theology around his death and mm. being developed as this idiom of the heroine of hell. Yes. Or if we're not, in fact, going around the death, but if it's, you know, um, how we align that with the academic <coughs> curriculum is another question, but I mm. wonder if the, the death is much more present than a lot of the literature has suggested and maybe even to some sort of soteriological mode, mm, mm. but thank you. Um, so the, the floor is, is open to questions. Thank you very much for this pedagogy uh, and clear lecture. I was uh, wondering about this motive of the cross that speaks. Uh -huh. um, there are several I know, sort of, uh, interpretations of it, e even uh, one that say that the cross did not speak, it was a domain. One of the nomina sacra that were misinterpreted. <laughs> so, are there any uh, parallels, cultural parallels? I mean, where did that come from? I'm very interested in the, in the, the relationship between the cross and language, because that's a matter of fact. All our narratives say that there is, there was a cross, and there is a book on the cross, I mean, the Hebrews. So this problematic of cross and language, cross and word, is quite interesting. And this little detail is fascinating. Did you find anything about it? <laughs> Thanks, Olivier Thomas. Um, I, I think the cross in the second and third centuries does begin to take on a sort of life of its own. Uh, I mean, that, that's a slight exaggeration. But, but, it, but it often appears for example, um, in Peru's in, in scenes of Jesus' return, uh, the cross the cross comes with Jesus when he comes back. Uh, um, the cross is uh, a symbol in, in the um, um, the what's the text called? The Acts of John. In the Acts of John, the, the cross it has, it has a, a significance in that the, um, the disciples dance around it. Uh, and, and so the, the cross emerges as a kind of symbol. I think in the Gospel of Peter, it's, it, it, it's, uh, Jesus and the cross together are a kind of hendiadis for the crucified Jesus. So uh, I think in, in contrast, for example, to say 1 Peter, where in 1 Peter 3, it's very much the risen and exalted Jesus who preaches to the spirits. Uh, in the Gospel, of P the Gospel of Peter, I think it's, it's very much the crucified Jesus who has gone down to Hades and preached to the, to the spirits in prison. Uh, before the resurrection, um, so I think the cross communicates something of that—that that, that, that it's the the pre-resurrection -re pre Jesus who has gone down to preach. I'm not sure if that I'm not sure if that helps you, <laughs> but perhaps we can talk more about it afterwards. It might be it might be interesting just to add that there's there's a play on this Joanine um, usage of the titles, um, and, and it seems that. Peter, um, both in changing it from King of the Jews to King of Israel, is very much interested in what's written uh, over the cross. Mm. Um, and I think this also ties into this suggestion about um, a kind of soteriological death that is presented in a very, very different way, granted, but um, I don't know if that's entirely evacuated when we're comparing it against the, um, uh, the apostolic curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this, this might play into the same pattern. In, 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 the gospel, in the Gospel of Truth, actually, the, uh, um, the, the resurrection scene is interpreted in connection with Revelation 5, where uh, it's actually a scroll. The, the Book of Life is, is nailed to the cross uh, and, 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 uh, and published, on, published on the cross uh, as well. So that may be connected. Thank you, brother. <coughs> Quite fun talk. <laughs> Um, one comment about the silence is that, like a sheep who is led to the slaughter, mm -hmm. so actually it doesn't necessarily have to say that 
uh, as to, um, but I wanted to make two points. The first one was, it does mention salvation. One of the criminals says that he is the savior of the yeah. world. So it is not that it's entirely missing, it's just been so radically and inappropriately downplayed next to the condemnation of Jews. So his death is far more of a condemnation than the fact of salvation. Mm -hmm. And as that puts up the act, it seems something like it seems to be the hero, which is all very, very peculiar. So it's not as absolute that it is absent, but it's very yeah. much downplayed. Yeah. And then the second point I wanted to, to mention was in relation to Titulus. Titulus in the Gospels is king of the Jews, mm -hmm. clear Roman governmental mocking so it makes perfect historical sense. Here it's the Jews themselves who write right in his king of Israel, which is a theological name for the Jewish people. So they, they sort of, um, uh, it makes it far less likely historically that they would say he's the king of Israel. And, and, and further, um, that they would be the ones to do it, and that they would theologize it so clearly, mm -hmm. so that it becomes a kind of prophecy. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree on that second point. On the first point, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm not at all saying that, that, that salvation is absent in the, in, in, from the Gospel of Peter. And um, I think this is one of those classic cases where if we had more of the text, we would know a lot more about how the Gospel of Peter understood how this salvation was taking place. Um, yeah, thanks. And I pick up on that. It's a question because I don't know much about this topic at all. When you mentioned Israel and the King of the Jews and King of Israel, uh, it just reminds me of divided kingdom, northern and southern, and that the role of David might have been associated with good kings in the south, and the King of Israel could well have been something think about Ahab and those being wiped out in the north, and that, that kind of thing. I, I don't know, is there anything to do with, with Israel there? Israel is <coughs> in particular. If you dare, really get pumped here. But if there's something negative about Israel, is that going mm. back to the Old Testament? Yeah, it, 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 I think if, if I were more confident that the, gospel, the author had a sort of careful knowledge of, of the Old Testament, then I might agree, but I think he probably he's probably using Judea and Israel fairly, and Jews fairly interchangeably, uh, I, I reckon. Some, some have argued sort of on the other side that, um, that King of Israel is, is more positive than King of the Jews because Israel is a reference to historic Israel rather than simply Jesus' Jewish contemporaries who are, who are, who are, who are bad. Uh, whereas, you know, thinking in terms of historic Israel that could be seen as something good. I think that, that on the other side is also probably um, probably viewing the Gospel of Peter too much in the synopsis. So, so if, if, you, if you go through, um, if you have you know, Mark's Gospel and the Gospel of Peter you know, side by side, then you might think that you know certain elements are deliberate modifications, but I'm not sure if the Gospel of Peter, if the author really had these texts, you know, in front of him and was making deliberate uh, changes at the micro level. I think there are deliberate changes at the macro level, um, but um, but yeah, probably not. Into I'm not sure that the, the reference to King of Israel has a particularly um, Particularly positive view, nuance either. So the, so the author would be more thinking of history of Josephus rather than the Old Testament. I think he probably means just the Jews as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Please enjoy me.